Well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Dave Ripplinger. I'm an economic specialist with NDSU Extension. Uh, I guess I didn't change the, the date on our first slide. It's April 15th, and this is our April Agricultural Market Situation and Outlook uh, webinar. Uh, we're going to have a series of presentations by different economic specialists with, at NDSU Extension, uh, followed by Q&A. Uh, we ask that you use the Q&A tool. Uh, if, if you're able, uh, we can also field questions via chat. Uh, but we'll save those towards the end. You're, you're welcome to ask them at any time during the presentation. Uh, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Brian Parman. Hey, thanks, Dave. So uh, I am the Ag Finance Specialist with uh, NDSU Extension Agribusiness. And I just recently got some uh, completed some news releases on land values and cash rents for both pasture and cropland in North Dakota. So I thought that this would be a good opportunity for me to go ahead and go through some of what I put out there and provide a little bit of additional commentary and context on the uh, what we saw with the trust land surveys data that we then compile it into these NDSU regions uh, based more on our uh, budgets, uh, the, how, we, how we group NDSUs uh, or the state of North Dakota into our budgetary regions. Uh, so there's a bit more homogenous in terms of what land values are doing and combine those counties. And we also do a weighted average so that, you know, areas with more land um, carry a little bit more weight than areas with fewer parcels or, or responses in the survey uh, to, to make sort of a weighted average. And, and that's one of the reasons why you might see a little bit of difference between like our state average and perhaps the way the USDA might calculate the average because we weight it. So my first slide uh, is just, I just kind of want to show um, what the USDA, when they, when they put out their 2020 stuff back in August, uh, what cropland across the US has done. And when you look at this and you've seen it before, but <clears throat> it, it goes to show uh, kind of what I'm going to talk about, how flat it's been since 2014. I mean, really it's been between, the average has been between $4,000 and $4,100. And it really hasn't changed much at all. In fact, uh, that's as close to moving sideways as, as you're ever going to see. Uh, and that comes off the heels of a fairly lengthy, you know, five, six year, uh, year over year increase, pretty sizable from $2,640 an acre up to $4,100. And then just, just sideways for the, for the last several years. Now, they don't have 2021 out. That won't come out until August. But as I go through this, I think you're going to probably agree with me. I don't, I don't expect that to change a lot, at least uh, into this year. So the first figure I'm, I'm showing with this presentation on North Dakota is uh, the average cash rent per acre of cropland in, in the state. And you can see the regions uh, across the top. You know, those are the northern and then the southern and the, on the bottom, except for the east central in the middle. And each region has several counties in it. Um, some, some more than others, like the Southwest is pretty large, but you, what we do here is we, we just kind of show six years what the, what the average per acre cash rent has been for cropland uh, in each one of those regions. And in the report, uh, I note that statewide uh, cash rents are up less than 1%, uh, actually about 0.77%. So a very small upward movement. And if you took a statewide average, uh, and again, this is this really doesn't do anything. A statewide average doesn't do much other than kind of benchmark the direction the state is going is, are all the cash rents across the state increasing, decreasing, or staying the same? Because if you look here, the most expensive rented land in the, in the states in the South Red River Valley, uh, and 2021's data shows that around 128, 128 and a half an acre. Um, then you have stuff is as, as low in the Southwest as $37 an acre for, for the average. But by and large, uh, as you can see from a point uh, less than 1% increase, rents this year are fairly close to where they were last year. In some areas you might've saw a slight reduction like the North Central from 5160 to 5110. And then for instance, in the Valley up uh, or South Valley, that is up, up almost $2, but that that's that could almost be chalked up to noise. Uh, you know, the da the data we get as much many observations as we can, but depending on who reports what, that can move the needle a few percentage points in and of itself. So no no real wide swings there, and it looks like cash rents for the most part 
Uh, heading into this year, we're about the same as they were last year uh, as far as cropland goes. Now, my next slide shows uh, land values of cropland across the state. So it's the same thing, except we're talking about uh, land value in dollars per acre instead of the cash rent rental rate. And as you would expect, the most expensive land also is the highest, has the highest rental value. And that's in the South Red River Valley uh, at 4,200 bucks an acre. You look at last year in the Valley, it was close to 4,000. But swings like that are not atypical. We saw them happen in 16 and 17. And again, that can be as much a function of data uh, as it, and, and not only that, but what the composition of what's been sold. If you have a, uh, a county, let's say, or an area where a bunch of high productivity index land sold last year, uh, it can look like uh, land values went up. And then the next year, let's say it's a little bit lower quality, uh, makes up the majority of the sales. Well, then it looks like land values went down. Well, they really didn't go down. It's just the composition of what was actually sold. And if you just lump it all together and take an average, it can look like things moved up or down. And really the value of, you know, taking an apples to apples comparison didn't change very much. But statewide, uh, up about one, one and three quarters percent. So not a big movement there. And if we took a, if we looked at where uh, uh, land values were across the state, again, this doesn't describe any one region very well, but it's good for benchmarking. 2021 across the state average 2,200 and almost $75 an acre. But again, there's wide swings, you know, the Southwest again being Southwest and, and Northwest being some of the least expensive land. A lot of that has to do with rainfall and soil quality and those kind of things. But we range from 2021 in the, in the Northwest at $1,250 per acre. And then you go to the Valley and it's, you know, three times, almost four times that expensive. But this, this just kind of shows it. And again, these, these regions, um, we break those out from 2015 through 2021. And by and large though, things have not really changed much. I mean, North Dakota uh, hasn't, ha has basically mimicked a lot of the U.S. as a whole where we, our land values have stayed relatively stable. And I'll give you a, an example. You look here at the, uh, um, some of these areas and, and we actually haven't even hit the high watermark, like the Southeast, for instance, if you look at the Southeast in 2018, uh, $3,021 an acre, 2020, 30, 50, and then 2021 down to 2805. I don't really think land values went down in that area. I, I think, again, that's that's a data thing. But for the most part, it's just bounded between about $3,000, 2800 2900 and 3000 bucks. So moving sideways mostly in that area. And, and that story is pretty much true in every region you look at, with a few exceptions. You got a big increase in the South Central, but Again, what was sold, uh, what was the composition there? Um, and that seems to be a bit of an outlier, okay? So my next slide is just a table that kind of shows the 2021 uh, rents and values in each of the regions uh, that are shown on the map just for, uh, to put it all together and make it easier to look at. And you can see the percent uh, change from the previous year. So that percent rental change, you see some, uh, a couple of areas showed that they declined, then other areas increased and some more than others at 3.5%. But overall, when you take into the size and how many acres, uh, it comes up to about a 0.7, almost three quarters of a percent increase. And then, you know, we got this big out, a couple of big outliers here. Uh, the Northwest says that land values, for instance, increased 15 and a half percent. I don't really think that's true. There just wasn't enough observations and a few transactions or sales really move the needle a lot. And then the same thing in the Southeast. So by and large, I think that maybe one to one and a half percent increase um, is probably pretty accurate or, or reflective of what actually took place. The, the thing about that though, to remember, and I don't show it in this presentation is we still have yet as a state to hit the high water mark that was reached, you know, back in 2014 and 15. So if I take the state average uh, land value for North Dakota, uh, each, each year since 2014, we've yet to get back to that despite the some of the increases we've seen over the last three. And then my next slide, uh, this, is, this is nationally, but it kind of shows an inflation adjusted versus a nominal. So if you look at that orange line, uh, up right there around 2014, it peaks, and then you can see it dipping down slightly 
And, and a lot of that is also when you take into account inflation. So if you can imagine land values, for instance, uh, trending sideways for 10 years, well, if you account for inflation in that, then land values actually wind up going down year over year because of inflation, because the buying power of the dollars decreasing uh, every year by a couple of percentage points. So if you just move sideways 10 years from now, for instance, well, that land would cost you less in terms of buying power of dollars that you actually have or spend. And so if you look at it in what we call in economics real terms, that's inflation adjusted, uh, you, get this, you get this reduction. Even though the nominal values may have moved upwards a little bit, if nominal values are not moving up at least as fast as inflation, okay, so if nominal values, if inflation's 3%, then you figure nominal values need to move close to 3% or better in order to just offset inflation. And that hasn't happened because they've, like I said, you look at that other slide and they've just moved sideways. So my next slide shows pasture land values uh, across the US, just like that crop one. And they have kind of moved upwards a little bit um, from that 2014 mark. That was almost $1,300 the last couple of years. It's been around $1,400 an acre across the nation. So a little bit of upward movement and it's been persistent, small, but persistent. So I would say there has been a trend upwards and it'll be interesting to see what 2021 looks like, but I don't anticipate nationally a big revision or a big upward movement in pasture land values either. Um, and, this, and then with all the drought stuff going on, uh, we'll see how that impacts everything. So. I do the same report, and if you look at my next slide, it shows uh, the same map and the same regions, but pasture land, and this is pasture land values uh, in dollars per acre. And you'll see the grayed out regions on the right-hand side of the state, the South Valley, the North Valley, and the Northeast. And I have to do that just simply because there are not enough um, pasture land sales or reports from the surveys to get a meaningful average out of that. You, you might just get a handful, one or two, and and, and I'm, we're pretty reluctant to report any kind of an average or something like that based off of one or two observations. I don't think it'd be very useful and it'd be highly volatile. You'd get just wild swings and I don't think any information could be gleaned from that. But statewide uh, pasture land values about $833 an acre. As you'd expect, the most uh, expensive pasture land is, is as you move further east. And last year that was around in the Southeast around 1,300 uh, $41 an acre down from some of the highs seen the previous years, which was closer to 1500 uh, other areas around, for instance, the East Central around $1,000 an acre. And then you move further West, uh, Southwest closer to 900 bucks and then the Northwest 650. But if you look at those numbers, 2020, 2021, like in the Northwest, you see pretty wide swings. And, and part of that's just the small sample size, not that pasture land's increasing and decreasing in that area, $100 an acre year over year. So I like to take these and take like a four or five, six year average uh, to see if it's persistent. And the truth is in North Dakota, it has been progressively moving upwards year over year, just very slowly. And you have to take a six year window in order to do that and benchmark it to the statewide average. And then if you look at pasture land rents, which is the, the next slide, uh, statewide that's set almost 17 and a half an acre, dollars per acre, uh, the least expensive being in the Northwest. And it's, uh, I think it goes without saying to everybody that tracks it, the stocking rates are much more dense in the East and the West due to rainfall and everything else. So when these calculations are done and you're benchmarking this, the dollar per acre is a good guide, but really this needs to be done on a dollars per AUM basis. Uh, simply because some areas have a lot more forage availability. So you don't need as many acres to raise an animal unit as you do in the West. So it being cheaper, it can still wind up being more expensive. Extreme examples include like where I'm from in Southwest Nebraska, you know, you're looking at about 12 acres per cow-calf pair. Uh, where I used to work at Mississippi State, it's two acres per cow-calf pair. Now pasture land down there is $2,500 to $3,000 an acre. And where I come from, it's, you know, $800 an acre, but when you take into account the, uh, the uh, forage availability, it was actually cheaper in the Southeast because of the density of the stocking rate. And there's other factors to consider there too. The more dense the stocking rate, the, the uh, uh, easier it is to manage. For instance, the animals don't have to walk as far to water, et cetera, et cetera. So there's some advantages to that as well. 
So my next slide, uh, I wanted to just talk about kind of farmers' expectations of farmland going forward. And this is from the Purdue University Ag, Ag Economy Barometer. It's a monthly survey that they do questioning farmers, not just in Indiana where Purdue, Purdue is located, but other neighboring states in the Corn Belt area. And they do this short-term expectation of farmland values. And this is an index. And what the number actually means, that 148, 140, don't worry about that as much. Just if the index is moving up, if the bars are taller, people, more and more people are expecting land values to increase in the short run. That's sort of the takeaway that I would like you to leave uh, from this. And short term is 12 months or less. Um, a lot of folks thinking that, you know, for, especially when you look at 520, which was around this time last year, uh, this was as low as it had been since 2015. And since then, it's been trekking upwards uh, over the last year to the highest it's been well in five, six years. So short run, uh, a lot of producers in the Corn Belt are expecting land values to increase. And then if you look at the, look at the next slide, uh, long term is more like a five year uh, planning horizon. And relative, uh, relative to where they were, um, yeah, there, there's an expectation that, that there is going to be a pretty good increase in the next five years, but not as strong as the, as the short run, which I kind of found a little bit counterintuitive because I would think hedging your bet to say that the five-year increase is more likely than a, than a one-year because, I mean, you got more time to do it. But, and the other thing is, you know, with the, the price rallies we've had here recently, you know, we're, we don't know how long those are necessarily going to hang out. And I've been on the record saying several times that six months isn't really enough to move the needle a long ways. So the last thing I want to talk about with respect to farmland uh, and, and to keeping in mind, because uh, uh, Dr. Olson will talk about um, commodity prices and he's the expert on that and where they're going. And we know that commodity prices impacts net revenues greatly and that and yields. Uh, also impact net revenues greatly. And so that's going to uh, Im impact the farm income. And then uh, Tim Petrie will talk about livestock prices and things like that, which impact obviously uh, profits from cattle and the, the amount of money you can make off an acre of pasture land. But the one, one final thing, and I talk about a lot is interest rates and what they're doing. So my next slide just shows the 30-year uh, mortgage rate, the 10-year T-bond, and then the green line is the federal funds rate. Okay, so the blue line is the 10-year T-bond, and then the red line is the 30-year mortgage rate. And it's pretty interesting. There's the, the relationship between the 30-year mortgage and the average 10-year uh, T-bond is about 150 to 170 basis points, or you can think of it as 1.5 and 1.7%. So those two lines, that red and that blue one, move together very closely. You can see it from the graph that when one moves, the other one tends to move or vice versa, that though that relationship is pretty strong, pretty strong and pretty consistent. Now the green line, the federal funds rate, you can see that the trend that the way it moves tends to move with the other two, or the I should say the other two move with it, but the relationship is not as strong as it is on those others. I mean, it's the other one, it, it's not one for one, but it, it's one of the closest you'll find in, 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 in the markets. But that federal funds rate and the other interest rates, basically the research has shown that the 10-year T-bond moves about 37 basis points or 0 0.37%, 0 0.37, for every 1% movement in the federal funds rate. And that, that relationship can be, because there's other things, unemployment, um, unemployment figures, uh, the composition of what the Fed is buying, what type of bonds they're buying imp influences that as well. But on average, it's 0.37. So the Fed can influence interest rates and, and uh, to a large degree, they, people say control it, but really what they do is they influence it. They cannot control the 10-year uh, T-bond. They cannot control mortgage rates. They influence it through activities and impacting the federal funds rate. And you can see here that it had been trending downwards and that, that's kind of how it works. But here on the right, you had this increase in the federal funds rate and it was pretty, pretty significant all the way up to almost two and a half percent. And you did not see uh, the 10-year T-bond or the 30-year mortgage move up nearly as large and greater magnitude as the federal funds rate did. So again, that's that imperfect relationship. It, they're related and there's a strong influence. But so then why do I bring that up? Well, 
you've got things happening in the uh, with the 10 year treasury note increasing due to inflationary fears the last several months. Well, the federal funds rate hasn't changed. It's been pegged near zero during that same period of time. So it doesn't have to, the federal funds rate does not have to move in order for the 10 year and the 30 year mortgage to actually move. There's other factors that influence it as well. So that's why the Fed's job in terms of controlling interest rates or trying to influence interest rates is, is difficult. And just finally on the Federal Reserve, the last thing <coughs> I'll mention is if you're wondering what they're gonna do, uh, basically, these dots represent voting members on, on the Federal Reserve. 2022, basically, they're th most of them are saying they're going to hold interest rates or hold the federal funds rate to where it is right now, which is between a quarter and zero basis points. Uh, there's one lone person, uh, that dark blue dot, who thinks that ought to be higher, but uh, everyone else says the same. And in 2023, most, except all, all but four, uh, think that they're going to stay at or near zero as well. So, but again, this can change. I mean, th this is basically saying if things stay the way they are right now and we stay on the path we're on right now, this is what they expect the federal funds rate to do for the next couple of years. Now, if something changes, inflation goes spiraling out of control or unemployment or who knows, uh, can change this. This is sort of a snapshot, a static snapshot of this is where we are and based on where we are, this is what we expect or what we think. So in closing, just a few general comments and things that I hope you take away. Crop and pasture land in North Dakota still not quite reached the high water mark set around five, six, seven years ago. Uh, it has inched upward off the lows. Uh, that's that's for sure. And I, and I, I think that we, we can see that when you look at the trends. But when accounting for inflation, I mean, we, we haven't even hit the high water mark yet. And then when you account for inflation at all, uh, they're actually down still a good bit. Um, and that's what I mean. Inflation eroded values further. Uh, there was another survey out, and I didn't show a slide on this presentation, that uh, done by the KC Fed in their region on what farmers intend to do with uh, the money they've uh, made through CFAP and higher commodity prices. And very few said they intend to buy new farmland with it. So we'll see if they tend to stick to that or, or if that's just something that was said and their minds might change. But most said they intend to pay down debt. So that's not uh, a, a bullish response for as far as farmland values go. Uh, but that said, Corn Belt farmers are still bullish on, on farmland values, especially in the short term. And then rising interest rates do put downward pressure on land values and upward pressure on cash rents. But so far, we haven't seen any indication that those who can influence interest rates have any interest in, in increasing them or, or doing anything like that. So there's just uh, not, not an appetite out there yet to, to increase rates, uh, despite uh, some folks' fears of inflation or, or, or something else. So we have question and answer uh, uh, throughout the uh, presentation and, and at the end. So I'll be happy to answer any questions you might come up with. And I think now I'm turning it over to Dr. Olson. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, so this, uh, this month, I'd, I'd like to look at things a little bit differently than I have before. We're not going to talk a lot about pricing, uh, but I am trying to, to give you some information, some resources that you, might, you will likely be wanting to use as we move through the growing season. Obviously, because of very tight stocks, in particular for soybeans and, and, and tightening stocks on corn, the growing season in 2021 is going to be under a lot of scrutiny. And we're going to be asking a lot of questions about crop development, about crop yield potentials, um, you know, and, and, and where are we sitting with, uh, with the national production levels. So what I thought I'd do this time is, is give you some resources that you can go to, some websites, some locations, actually some new information that USDA has available that I think are going to be actually really kind of cool and, and interesting to look at throughout the summer months. I do plan to inclu include some of this in my uh, presentations as we move forward in time. So this time I want to really look at, I'm not a weather person, I'm not a weather forecaster, so I'm, I'm kind of... Um, getting to the edges of my expertise a little bit, but I, what happens in the weather, what obviously what happens in soil moisture conditions, growing conditions uh, is gonna have a huge impact on psychologically on market prices and what we expect to happen as we move forward. 
So on my first slide, I, I just did reproduce the drought monitor map that was that was released this morning. Uh, you're going to see a lot of uh, a lot of press about watching the drought monitor maps as we move through the rest of the summer months. And obviously, that big bl uh, red blob in the middle of North Dakota is not going to help us much. Uh, and, and there are people that are very, very concerned about what's going on right now for very legitimate reasons. However, I want to make sure that we understand what this information is really telling us. So within the drought monitor um, and, and the maps that are prepared, they're really looking at the entire soil profile. They're looking at what are the moisture conditions within the entire soil profile. So those yellow areas really represent where, where, where if the crop were to be growing, there'd be some crop stress. That it, it's not that we're really seeing any kind of yield reductions yet, but the crop would be under stress. In the brown areas, what's happening is that dry layer is moving a little bit deeper into the soil profile. By the time we get into those uh, darker uh, browns and, and more importantly, the reds and the maroons, what's happening is that, again, the soil moisture level, the, where the water table is within the soil profile is getting deeper and deeper. So the drought is becoming more intense and, and for example, in the red areas, you start to see uh, stock ponds going dry. You start seeing wells having problems. <coughs> Excuse me, some of the irrigators may have some problems being able to pump enough water volume. But from a cropping standpoint, what we're really concerned about is what's happening within that top soil level, layer. So even though the, we may have very, very dry conditions in the deeper soil layers, if we can have regular rains at the right time, we can still have some pretty good yield potential. So I want, I want everybody to think about that, yes, the drought monitor map influences psychology in the marketplace. People are watching it. <coughs> Excuse me, it's up, updated on a weekly basis, so we get new information all the time. But it may not really represent growing conditions, so we got to be a little bit careful of that. On the next slide, I just give you uh, a, a quick synopsis of, <coughs> excuse me, I got a tickle. Um, the drought monitor map is released every Thursday morning. Um, if you, the easiest is to you know type into uh, whatever search engine you're using. If you just type uh, type in or Google uh, U.S. drought monitor, it's usually the top thing that that appears on 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 the search. Um, I did give you the URL, so if you did want to type it in and find that information, that's fine. The next slide is information that the USDA prepares. Okay, so once the drought monitor maps have been released by uh, the folks at the University of Nebraska and Lincoln, the USDA takes that information and they overlay the drought monitor maps on top of the typical growing regions. And so usually uh, either late the, that same day on a Thursday or sometimes Friday morning, depending upon what's going on, they'll they'll show you these kinds of maps. And I know uh, Tim Petrie uses these kinds of maps in his discussions about uh, pasture conditions. So even though there might be a, a very severe drought going on here in North Dakota, we have to be, from a pricing standpoint, how much of the total production might be impacted for corn, soybeans, wheat, or other crops, uh, given the drought area. So what's really nice about this is given typical production, these kind of average production or bushels produced over the last several years, you can see the darker the green the, are, are considered major, in this case, corn growing areas. And then the, the lighter uh, green is minor corn growing regions. And then the, the, the red hash represents those drought areas. So this is the information from last week. I, I just checked USDA has not updated this, this mapping system yet, but they will shortly. Uh, based on last week's uh, information, about 19% of the corn production, meaning bushels, are under some kind of drought or drought stress at this time. Okay, so there's a, there's a map very similar to this for, for well, a map for corn. Um, the next slide would be the map for soybeans. So again, notice the growing area where we have these major production regions shifts a little bit between corn and soybeans. Even though that major Midwest Corn Belt, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, again, are, and, and Nebraska are really that the core center of that, we do have a larger geographic footprint for soybeans than we do for corn. So right now, when you count bushels, approximately 17% of the bushels that we normally produce are experiencing some level of drought 
or, or based on the, on the drought monitor maps. The next slide is the same picture for spring wheat. And obviously spring wheat being this region of the dominant production is North Dakota, approximately 80% of the bushels right now for spring wheat is, is being either partially or, or in a major way impacted by drought. And this again is one of the reasons that the corn market and the soybean market may respond a little bit differently than the spring wheat market to new information within the drought monitor maps as we start looking at, at the changes over time. Again, I wanna remind everybody the drought monitor map is looking at the soil moisture levels in the full soil profile. Okay, so how do you find this information from USDA? The next slide just shows you again, when is it released? It's usually every Thursday, late afternoon. Sometimes it's a Friday morning. If you're gonna search for this, if you're gonna use a web browser and try and search for it, just type in USDA agriculture in drought. Okay, it may not be the first item that shows up in that search, but if you look down for something from the USDA, if you look at that URL, if you look for uh, uh, this PDF file. So when you click on it, what's gonna happen is you'll get a PDF file that comes up automatically. So the next slide is some additional information that USDA has created in conjunction with NASA. So for the last several years, um, both USDA and NASA have been collecting a lot of satellite imagery about the, uh, North, about North American agriculture, in particular U.S. agriculture, and they now have a website, and, and I just recently found it, um, that's called CASMA, CASMA, which represents the Condition and Soil Moisture Analytics. So what they're trying to do here is they're using satellite imagery, and they've cross-validated with actual ground truthing. So the USDA, as well as NASA, have been doing this satellite imagery for many, many years, and they're now um, allowing access to it so you can do your customized search. So this is actually a website you can go to and based off of the different filters that you wanna put on it, you can get some really interesting information about what's happening, not necessarily in the entire soil profile, but more importantly, what's happening on the surface or within the root zone. So I, I have a series of maps here just to show you the flexibility. You go to one website, and depending upon the kind of, of map that you want to create or the kind of information that you want to search for, it'll, it'll present the same information slightly differently. Now, on the very bottom of this slide, you'll notice that I have uh, some background information about what information is available. So when you go to this website, the first default page you're going to get to is called Soil Moisture Anomaly. So if you, if you find this website and you, and you automatically pop it up, the first thing you're going to see is a map very similar to this. Okay, now this is soil moisture anomaly. So what they're looking at is how does the current soil profile, soil moisture profile, compare to average or normal? Okay, now for the surface moisture, these soil moisture anomaly, they're using data from about 2015 through the current. So they don't go back, you know, back, 20 or 30 or 40 years, they use from about 2015 forward because that's the data that, that they, they have that's most reliable from the existing satellite imagery. Okay, so we're looking at what is today's soil moisture content relative to what we would normally see at this time of year. And you can see that percentage. So this would be a percentage soil moisture relative to normal. And this is for the top two inches of soil moisture. So if you notice the red is highlighted on the very bottom, I have top two inches. If you want to change the parameters, if you wanna change the, the map, you can get either a two, two inch, or you can get a one meter depth. Now the one meter depth was, is about 3.2 uh, feet. You can choose whether you want this daily information where it's updated on a daily basis, and looked at it from, a, from a, a daily perspective or from a weekly perspective. So you can choose a very short term if you wanna look, look at what the current soil moisture is, kind of average for a week, relative to what this week looked like over the last several years, you can do that. Now I pulled this information this morning. Um, so I, I pulled all the maps that you see this morning. Now the, when we say, when I say daily, there is a slight delay. So the information you see on this map is for the top two inches of soil. And uh, it was as of April 12th, which is about two, almost three days ago now. So it's updated daily, but there is this lag or this delay in getting the information updated. 
So you see a, a little bit different picture about in particular what's happening here in North Dakota, but also what's happening across the other parts of the United States. So we're not really concerned about what's going on really deep in the soil profile. We're trying to look at what's more importantly, what's happening at the soil surface or in, in particular in that growing zone. And again, during the spring's work, we're really concerned about that top soil moisture. If we're gonna put seed in some, in some dry soil, is, it, is there enough moisture there for it to sprout? Okay, so you can see based on the, la the rainfall we've had over the last several, uh, several days, you could look to the southwest corner or southeast corner, excuse me, of North Dakota. You can see we're actually in the blue when you look at the soil moisture conditions for this week, or for the last several days relative to the, what we would normally see at this time of year, we're normal to slightly above normal in the Southeast. But you look at uh, the rest of the state, obviously we're well behind. On the next map, it's the same information from the same website, but I just changed the, the, the essentially the search parameters. I changed, changed the map to represent information a little bit differently. So what they're looking at here is the actual an estimate of, and again, this is satellite imagery that's been cross-validated by, by, by um, um, actual soil tests. This is actually looking at what is the percent soil moisture. So what we're looking at is how many cubic millimeter, cubic meters of water is in a cubic meter of soil. So think about it again, percent soil moisture. Now this is for the top meter of soil. If you notice on the very bottom, I have highlighted in red, this is for the top meter. So this is again, an estimate of the top three feet. How much moisture do we have in that top three feet of, of soil? If I wanted to, I could switch the map to the top two inches. I just wanted to demonstrate you can change the depth of, of the estimates. Also notice now, as we get into that, that south, uh, the Southern part of the US, in particular the Southeast, They've had lots of rain showers coming through over the last several weeks. The soil profile, when you get into Louisiana, Mississippi, uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, you know, they've got a really full soil profile. And there are some questions starting to be raised about whether they're going to have some prevent plant in those areas. So this can be used not only for tracking what's happening in North Dakota, but what's happening more importantly at a national basis. And again, so this is the same Compute this is the same website, you go to the same place, but you just click on the different choices on what you want the map to represent. Okay, and again, these can be updated either on a daily basis or a weekly basis. Now, this is weekly information. I, I pulled up for the weekly information. Now, the, this is as of the week ending April 5. Now, I'm expecting them to update the computer models here pretty quickly. Uh, so, this would be as of uh, April 5th. And of course, today is the 15th. So there is a little bit of a delay between when they compile the data and when it's actually published. On the next slide, again, you can, with the same um, um, computer program with the, by just changing some of the, the mapping or mapping parameters, this represents again, the soil moisture categorically. So rather than looking at it as an absolute value, like a number, they put it into different categories. So is it very short, which is the brown? Is it kind of a, a short being the yellow? Is it adequate? Is it surplus being the dark green? Or don't we have data, which is gray? So again, very quickly from a picture standpoint, you can have an idea of what this looks like. It does have the ability to be able to zoom in. So you can zoom in on a particular county or a particular area or region. Just be cautious if you do zoom in, you, the, it starts getting kind of pixelated. You, you, you lose, the resolution isn't extremely detailed on this, but it does give you a pretty nice picture of what's happening. So this is soil moisture on a categorical ba basis. If you look on the very bottom highlighted in, in, the, in the red, it's, it's the top soil moisture that I'm looking at. Um, and again, this would be for, uh, um, this is only available for weekly basis. It's not available on a daily, on a daily basis. The next slide, using the same computer program, they also provide satellite imagery for vegetative index. So later on right now, this, this is gonna be all brown basically because we haven't planted the crop yet. So to use this information at this stage of the growing season really doesn't provide you a lot of, of, of insight into what's going on. 
but later on, as, we, as the crop begins to grow, as, it, as we plant it and starts to germinate and start to grow, we can get an idea of what is the vegetative health, how green is the crop as we look across the United States. So NDVI, which is that normalized difference vegetative index, it's, a, it's basically how green is the crop. They're using different spectral ranges on the satellite to take pictures, say how, how green is this crop? If it's if obviously if it's very dark green, it's very healthy, we get, a, we get a darker color. If it's under some kind of stress, typically you have less chlorophyll, so it means it's a little bit lighter green. You do have the ability to look at, what I did here was I filtered it. I said, I, I just want a picture of not all of, the, all of the United States, whether it's forest land or pasture land or cropland. I was able to filter it and click on a button and say, I just wanna look at the, the cropland acres, not necessarily forage, uh, like a pasture land or forage acres, or more importantly, forested acres. So I, you do have the ability to look at just all acres or all, all land mass, as well as filter it down to say, let's just look at crop acres only. Um, now this information is only updated weekly. So it's, you can't get it on a daily basis, but you can get a weekly number to say, for this week, relative to history, how do we compare to what we normally see at this time of year? So we, you have the choice to go either in an absolute terms or in a relative term. Okay, the next slide is again, the same website, the same pieces of information, but this is looking at the mean vegetative condition index. So now what we're looking at is, again, how do we look at it? The NDVI I showed you before is the absolute. So just how green is the crop? This is how green is the crop compared to what we would normally see at this time of year. So now it's being relative to a normal. Now, based on what I could tell, I couldn't find out what the definition of normal was. How far back in time do they go? How many years? I wasn't able to, to find that information but I, I will keep digging and I'll, I'll try and, and update you as I have more information. The point is by one little, you know, check the box, you can now switch it from what is the absolute picture to how does this compare against average or typical? So, uh, you know, it, it's great to see what areas are really healthy and looking good, but is it the same as what we saw last year or the last several years? So if you have an area that shows some differences it can show up in this map. And again, I filtered it based upon cropland acres, not necessarily all, all acreage or all vegetative, vegetation across the United States. Okay, so on my next slide, where do you get this? And again, I found this very valuable. It takes a little bit of time to kind of figure out how to, how to maneuver around and, and be able to filter and sort things out. So, you know, it, you might have to experiment a little bit. They do have a, a manual that's online that you can download and look at, at the instructions if you wish. So information is updated either daily or weekly, but understand there's always a delay. It, it takes a little bit of time to take the imagery, to, to, to create the data, the, to convert the data from the numbers that are being captured into the maps that you see generated. If you're gonna go into your search engine, whatever search engine you're using, type in USDA crop CASMA, C-A-S-M-A, okay? And what'll happen is you'll go to this, this website here, which is that research and science. Okay, and what'll happen is you're gonna have several choices on some different kinds of, of, of satellite imagery that's available. Make sure that you use that CASMA, C-A-S-M-A, to get this information. All right, on my next slide, I just wanna remind everybody that, so that was looking at soil moisture and crop conditions. Um, I want to remind everybody, this is a tremendous resource we have available here in, in North Dakota and parts of Minnesota. We're very blessed to have ENDON, which is a North Dakota Agricultural Weather Network. So if we're looking at for weather specific data, what's going on here in North Dakota, this is the most accurate information you're going to get. And they collect a tremendous amount of, of data. They, you have some choices to be able to create some maps. I just did uh, uh, created this morning a real quick rainfall map. How much rainfall have we had over the last seven days? And, and literally, it's go to the website, click on the maps, click on what you want, and the and the 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 image is generated. So if you're trying to follow what's going on here in North Dakota specifically with weather, 
you know, with rainfall, with soil moisture temperatures, with uh, humidity, with temperatures. Um, this is a tremendous resource that we have available. We're very, very fortunate to have this um, in our portfolio of things that we can use to try and understand what's happening to the crop here in North Dakota. So again, this is a, a seven day rainfall total. If you look at the next slide, um, I did pull up the um, soil temperature uh, map. If we can go to the next slide, please. There we go. So this would be uh, soil temperatures that are actually measured by the different weather stations across the state. This would be for bare soil. So it's, it's not a, a turf temperature, which would be like in your lawn. This would be a, a bare soil more, more closely related to what the field would, be, would look like. And, and again, for uh, it's in the top four inches of the soil layer. So obviously what's, if you have several really nice sunny warm days, these, so, these soil moisture temperatures can pop up. Right now they're relatively low. This is kind of interesting to watch because if you do have some wheat or barley that's been planted, you know, at what, at what soil moisture temperature do you need that germination to start? So in the spring, it's really nice to be able to look at, at, at potential growth and growth potential. Uh, I just pulled up some of the basic information that's available. So to find the next slide, to find um, the um, Endon numbers or Endon information, again, this is actually updated hourly. So if you're interested in getting information again about current weather conditions, humidity, potential temperature inversions, if you're out spraying in the field, a uh, tremendous source of information. They also have a really nice app that's now available uh, to give you some um, warnings if you do have, have conditions that are suitable for temperature inversions. So please check it out. Uh, if you're searching on the web, look for North Dakota or ND Agricultural Weather Network, and it should pop right up. And there's the, eight, uh, the URL if you want to type it in directly. So my point in bringing all this up to try and conclude is, as we're going through the rest of the, of the summer growing season, the weather is always an interest uh, to the crop markets, but in particular this year, because of our ending stocks being so tight specifically for soybeans, but also now tightening for corn, there's gonna be a lot of pressure on, the, on the, the crop and the growing season in 2021. And I guarantee you the markets are gonna be watching this very, very closely. So I wanted to give you some resources that you can go to to be able to look this up yourself if you wish. So with that, I'll hand things over to uh, Tim Petrie. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Tim Petrie here, Extension Livestock Marketing Economist. If we go to my first slide, I just want to quickly give you an update on calf prices and then move into some drought issues. Um, in spite of the drought, speaking of that, and $2 increasing corn prices, feeder cattle uh, this year are following a much more normal historic seasonal price pattern, unlike with the pandemic last year. So a lot of lines on this chart mainly uh, concentrate uh, now on the purple line was last year. And then the red line is this year. These are 550 to six weight calf prices in North Dakota, the markets at USDA report. So as you can see, we've been gradually increasing, had a nice bounce uh, last week and maybe more so because we've had some really nice strings of, of high high quality calves bounced. But anyway, the last three years, uh, 2017 isn't on this chart, but 17, 18 and 19, we had 180 there uh, towards the end of April, 1st of May. And uh, last year we were on the purple line, we're on track to do that. There in February, we we're already up to 176, but then the pandemic hit and crashed prices. And again, we underperformed the entire year, although the last half of the year was the same as 2019, although that wasn't a particularly good price year, as you all know. Now, this year, uh, you know, we're right up there bouncing up to 180 again. My thought is, you know, it all depends on what the drought does and what corn prices do and they keep uh, going up and, you know, change corn 10 cents a bushel, change fall calf prices a buck in the opposite direction. But I'm looking for us to follow that, uh, assuming that the the drought doesn't affect corn and corn just goes up another dollar or two that we'll kind of follow that blue line on the top there with better prices. But again, the big thing is corn. So go to the next slide. And uh, there we got the heavyweight yearling type of cattle in kind of the very same scenario there. So I won't repeat it. It's just that again, we'll follow that blue line up there of 2018. Now I agree the Fed cattle are trading and are 
the futures are quite a bit higher than 2018, but why I'm using 2018 for calf prices is simply because of the $2 higher corn prices. But you see, we have a futures market for 800 pound steers and it's pretty much right on the blue line, uh, all of that light blue line on top all the way up through fall and even higher when we get to the later uh, end of this year there up about 160 compared to even in 2018 under 150. And then, you know, the general cyclical trend is for higher cattle prices, assuming no catastrophic events because we've been reducing the herd the last couple of years and it's not gonna go up this year with the drought. So on the left-hand side, then those orange dots then are for 22 even higher. So move on to the next slide. Uh, just to give you some drought information. Uh, uh, as Frain showed you, there's drought and I, you know, I won't repeat all the drought monitor stuff there, but the nice thing about the USDA Livestock Forage Disaster Program is that it's tied to the drought monitor. Instead of the old days, we had to do it on a county by county basis and, and each county had to be declared a, a, a federal disaster area either by the secretary or the president. So it was a big, you know, every county in North Dakota, one by one, we had to get declared a disaster area. And now, and that's still the case, for instance, for like uh, CRP gra grazing, early opening of CRP and others. But the livestock forage program now is tied to the drought monitor. So USDA uh, does not have anything to do with it. We don't have to do any applying or anything. It's automatic. You see there 76% of the state is in D3 extreme drought and 17% in D2, those are important. So if you go down to the bottom, then what triggers payments is during the normal grazing period, if any part of the county hits some of those uh, D levels, it automatically triggers payments. And our actually our grazing season for North Dakota started today, as you see there, October 15th and uh, April 15th and ends October 15th. So you have to be in D2 for eight straight weeks to get a one month payment. But when you hit D3, you get a, a, a qualify for a three month payment. And as you can see, we, you know, uh, 76% I'll show you the counties in a minute. Actually, 43 counties there qualify for three payments already. Go to D4, you move up to four months and uh, and uh, D4 for four weeks up to five monthly payments. So, you know, we don't know what the monthly payments are going to be yet when they do come out. Uh, usually don't come out to May and that's when we can could start applying, but you kind of want to wait to see how it goes. Uh, last year, the 2020 monthly payments, that was $18 per cow, that's for a one month payment. So we would, for this year, if it's the same would, for the D3 uh, area there would, would multiply by three. And last year, just three counties uh, qualified. When the USDA information comes out, it's gonna show a much higher number than that. Like last year it was $32, but the small print says they only pay 60% of, of what their estimated feed costs are. And then they take another 5.7% off for sequestration. So that lowers it down from 32 to about 18. So go to the next slide. Uh, while we're on the drought monitor topic, right on the drought monitor website that Frayne talked about, there's an FSA eligibility map there, the website shown on top. So you can just click on your county to see what you qualify for. I just clicked on North Dakota and now show showing those 43 counties uh, that are eligible. The other thing is it just barely has to hit the nick of a county for the whole quality county to qualify. Nelson County, for instance, up there, it just barely hit it in one little corner, but the whole quali uh, county qualifies. But unlike the other programs where you do the, the uh, CRP and everything, contiguous counties do not count. This, the actual, Drought monitor has to hit that county. So go to the next slide. Uh, here, you know, it is not looking too optimistic. Also on the drought monitor webpage, they do a seasonal outlook. This is through June 30th, showing the brown that uh, drought persisting, and then the yellow is drought development likely, which comes down into our southern states. We're basically in a drought anyway. So, uh, you know, we're faced with drought. And so uh, on the livestock side, we're going to initiate some other 
uh, drought webinars be the last Thursday of the month so it doesn't conflict with this one you're on today, which is in the middle of the month, but we're going to do a drought a Zoom meeting just like this, as those shown there the last Thursday of the month. If you want to register, just go to that uh, end issue drought. So the next slide. Uh, we have our state climatologist Adnan every week does a briefing when the drought monitor comes out to tell us how severe the drought is. He has developed a drought severity coverage index. And um, so you see on the bottom, the drought monitor actually started back in 2000 and up through the current and, it, and that purple line then just shows the severity of the drought. And this was of last week because he hasn't got, the, got it updated yet for uh, the new one that just came out this morning. But we're already in the worst drought that we've had since the drought monitor that started in 2000 with his index up there at 365. We've had other droughts back 2017, you know, 290, 295, we had uh, some drought back in, in uh, 2013 and also back in 2006 and eight that were quite severe. But I want you to kind of just remember uh, this, this index here because I'm gonna transpose that over onto the number of cattle that we have in beef cows that we have in North Dakota, just to kind of show you some possible impact there. So go to the next slide is uh, on the top is January 1st beef cow inventory. And uh, so you can see there, we did go down a little bit on January 1st, uh, 2021, 20,000 uh, head down there, about, we're about 975,000 beef cows in North Dakota, and we've got the worst droughts yet. And if we go back and look at some of those past droughts back into 2017, uh, you know, uh, we had uh, 954,000 and 12, 862,000, 2008, 924,000 and so on. So we've got the highest number of beef cows on hand, at least on January 1st, that we had uh, in any of the previous uh, droughts here since 2000. So we got a lot of cows to take care of and we got dry, very dry pastures. So that is certainly a concern for us. Also on the bottom, you see the number of replacement heifers that we have on January or had on January 1st. And we've been keeping a lot of replacement heifers in North Dakota, more than we need here, but it's more of a, of a profitability type of enterprise where heifers are extremely low priced in the fall. And so producers keep them and develop them into replacement heifers. And so the report on January 1st that they're replacement heifers, but we had on January 1st of this year, the fifth largest number of replacement heifers ever since back in 1920. In fact, you see there in the last, a uh, number of years there since 2007. We've had a lot of years. We could add 2018 and 19 are the seventh and eighth. So we do keep a lot of replacement heifers and have a lot on hand. But one of the nice things about replacement heifers is that, you know, if we face a drought, you know, we can, we don't, these were planned to be put in with a bull this summer, but we don't have to do that. And it gives us some flexibility and uh, we can sell them. And so uh, go to the next slide uh, here, kind of to, to uh, wrap up, uh, uh, Stockman's out in uh, Dickinson is having a sale today and, and a pretty big sale. They already had 2,500 consigned as about a day ago, 1,500 of them are these replacement heifers that would be put in with the bull this, this summer and also then about another 1,000 breeding stock. And so, uh, you know, it's a big sale. It's hard to say you know exactly how many of these might have been forced liquidation to the drought because some of them are developed and would be sold anyway in the spring. But I'm assuming that uh, uh, at least uh, maybe not a, a, a all of them, but a, a, quite a number of them are 
uh, forest due to drought. Yesterday at KISS, 70% of their, their uh, receipts were, were heifers. And so again, uh, instead of going in with a bull, and they still could be purchased as replacement heifers, but we're seeing uh, liquidation of cows already. But on the good news and on the left-hand side, this is last week's average prices for uh, heifers in North Dakota at the three markets, Napoleon and, and uh, Mandan and, and Dickinson. Uh, if when you look at those replacement heifer prices there where it says replacement, you know, starting off with those 687 pounders at 139, bringing $956 and then all the additional uh, replacement heifers down there are, are over a thousand dollars till you get down to those 945 pounders there at about $1,130. So still generating money and even the feedlot heifers are uh, generating money. So uh, I think uh, go to the next slide. I think I'm finished and we'll turn it over to Dave to wrap up. Great. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Dave Ripplinger, Bioproducts Bioenergy Economic Specialist. I just have a few comments to make about uh, corn ethanol specifically and some things that I'm kind of watching. Uh, so my first slide is uh, days in, in storage uh, for ethanol over actually the la almost last decade. And a little bit of noise there, but a couple of things to point out. So one of the first thing that jumps out is last year when we had uh, a shutdown essentially in the economy, uh, we saw those, those days in storage uh, dramatically increase. We continued to produce, it wasn't being used. Uh, but really what I want to look at is that, that black line, which is actually this year. And so as we, we go across that line from left to right, you know, we're moving from January through today. And we can see that that days in storage number is continuing to decline, which means that we're, we don't have as much in stock relative to our use. And so that's, uh, depending on where you sit, uh, uh, good news or bad news, um, it's driving up ethanol prices, uh, which is, you know, positive uh, on, on the demand side, but there's some other concerns. One of the things to really look at, and we're really not there yet, and there's not too much talk about it, uh, but it does make me think back to 13 and 14, um, when we had very high ethanol prices, both of those years, we, we, you know, we had ethanol prices over $2 every month, but one, and oftentimes close to $3 a gallon, very high prices. Uh, right now, we're not there yet. Um, Prices reported by Iowa State are $1.73 a gallon for March. Uh, USDA for South Dakota last, last week was $1.81. Clearly going up, we're already in that place where we're in some of the highest prices we've seen in the last decade. And if things tend to continue, which they might, you know, we could see those prices dramatically increase. And one of the, the words to use here is, you know, we're, we're reaching this point where things are getting a little bit uh, inelastic and those prices might go up a lot uh, faster. Um, to, to try and pull additional production uh, online. We're still at about 90% of where we were uh, prior to COVID, not a year ago. A year ago, we were really uh, in the midst of the, 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 the rapid shutdown of the industry, but kind of 90% of where we were, gasoline use, uh, travel demand, especially looking for the rest of the year, especially the summer is, is really uh, bullish. This, this is paired with high corn prices. So it's not as if the corn ethanol refiners are, are making much money, but it should be a signal to the corn industry that there is uh, you know, some pretty stable demand uh, for, the, for, for ethanol and consequently for corn. And that kind of leads me to one of my bigger concerns. And that's this uh, stock use ratio. So you know, WASD came out last week uh, looking really closely. Right now we have very high prices because we're going to use a lot of the corn, soybeans, other crops that we produce and end with very low stocks relative to use. So this is a, a really common chart that you see egg economists produce. And on the, the horizontal axis, we have stocks to use. So ending stocks versus use for the whole year. Uh, and then on the vertical axis, it's dollars per bushel. In this case, it's the farm gate. And what you can kind of see is, is there's kind of like a big clump of data in, in the middle and then to the right, uh, including in 2021. But if you go just a little bit to the left, you know, if we, if we start at 2021, which has a dark uh, open circle, uh, you know, you can see that level. Um, if you go and, and just in, decrease stocks a little bit relative to the use, you see this dramatic increase in corn price. And so we go back to 12 and 13, uh, which were, you know, historically high, uh, prices for corn. And so we're in that realm. And so the numbers I look at really closely are, you know, that, that bottom line and that ending stocks number, and then also where ethanol's at and where other things are at. And, you know, we're, we're in that place where just a small little click and, and, and USDA typically moves uh, or changes numbers in, in 25 million bushel increments. 
you know, we're in that place where as they, if they start to make those changes, you know, you're moving, you're moving that number really, really quickly. Uh, if, if it's in terms of uh, increased use to the right, pretty quickly. And again, we're in that place, that inelastic place where prices could rise dramatically. Could be good news in general for Midwestern corn farmers, not necessarily good news for corn ethanol refiners, uh, even though there is, uh, you know, stable demand, growing demand for that product, you know, that, that feedstock cost could be really quite onerous. So something I'm watching every month, I'm going to be looking at those, those minor little tweaks if and when they're made all across that, that, that S and D uh, for corn. And it could be, it could be a bit surprising. And again, any, uh, you know, any disruption that's not foreseen. So if we do have uh, uh, production related issues, if we do see some increased demand or really strong demand, you know, either, uh, in ethanol or elsewhere, you know, we could see, you know, really high prices uh, moving forward. Uh, last comment I want to make is just regarding uh, CPI. So the, the, the inflation index numbers came out last week was a little bit interesting for a couple of reasons. One is we're basically a year past the bottom, uh, more or less of where we were. So some of these numbers are really, really big. Uh, and so, you know, the, the price of energy relative to last year is significantly higher. And you know that's a little bit uh, deceitful because we had this really high low and then and kind of what you might consider an average number for last month. But if you look at the trajectory of where we're at, and again, this is uh, a basket of energy products that urban consumers buy uh, uh, adjusted for seasonality, but this is gasoline, uh, this is heating oil, those types of things, that basket, that price is increasing really, really quickly. Uh, and, in, and if you could actually map this really closely, it would follow petroleum crude oil uh, pretty closely as well. If you if you, we look just at this length from 2018 through last month, you'd say, well, we're kind of just getting back to where we were. And that's true. Uh, but if we extend things even further, if we go back to uh, 2012, and really what I'm looking at is 2014, we're hitting this level where we're actually as high as we were in 2014. If you go back to the middle of 2014, this was $100 oil, and I'm not saying we're going to go back to $100 oil, but that was a period where we had very tight supplies of energy and relatively high prices. And if our trajectory continues, you know, you'd expect to see not only these higher retail prices, but higher wholesale prices, which, depending on where you sit, is, is a good thing or a bad thing. And it might be enough to first, maybe from our perspective, bring on additional ethanol refining capacity, which is currently idle, or from that North Dakota perspective, uh, lead to additional uh, oil development, which has really been lagging uh, ever since COVID hit. So those are my general comments. Uh, right now, i open it up for a question and answer uh, and bring all the panelists back to have any answer any questions uh, you might have. And then of course, as we kind of segue to this, this place, are there any questions or comments that we had uh, either during uh, following your, your presentation or as other people spoke. I don't know, Frank, if you have some insights on, on what I shared, maybe tell everybody I'm completely off base. Uh, no, you know, you're actually very close. <laughs> uh, you know, I, cause I do obviously follow the corn market very, very closely uh, the, that stocks to use ratio and the relationship between prices. And, and we are at that, at kind of at that tipping point. What I usually say is 10% stocks to use ratio is kind of that tipping point. If, if the marketplace has, if we have more than 10% carryover stocks, prices tend to be relatively low and stable. The, the, the market feels comfortable that we have reserves in cases of problem next year. If we get less than 10% and we're now under 10%, all of a sudden the market gets very, very nervous. So we tend to have higher average prices, but a lot of price volatility. So on the corn side, when you look at corn stocks, um, the old crop corn supplies are getting tighter. They're not as tight as what we saw, obviously, back in 2011, 12, 13, 14, but they're much tighter than we've seen over the last several years. And so that's putting additional pressure on the growing season in 2021, which, again, we're going to see a lot of price volatility. And I don't see any questions up. Apparently, we're, we're answering all the questions last month and this month. There's one. Um, Anybody have any other thoughts? One, one question I kind of have for Brian looking at, at farm prices, you know, if there's potentially, you know, significant inflation underway, uh, which is, which is possible, 
uh, you know, do you expect that there would be an increase in farmland prices? Are folks going to look at that as an investment um, in, in some respects as they did, you know, a, a decade ago, five, 10 years ago? They might, but as we've just seen, it's not necessarily a hedge against inflation at all. I mean, I just, you know, it's, if it's trading sideways and, and inflation is occurring, then just because it's a hard asset does not necessarily make it a hedge against an inflation, especially if people think that it was either aptly priced or overpriced or depending on how the farm economy goes. So there may be those folks who think that, and that was the, that was kind of the logic. Um, but I wonder, I, I do wonder a little bit if folks have soured on that notion that, well, you know, hard assets or, or tangible assets tend to, increase with inflation. Um, I don't, I wonder if some of that's been soured upon now, is there inflation right now? Maybe, uh, I, I think it's going to be a while before we can see if there actually is. And there's so much stuff going on. That's mixed. We've got, we got mixed indicators. There's nothing, there's no neon sign pointing up, down, or any other direction. You've got a bunch of small signs pointing in different directions and it, it's really tough to sort out exactly, uh, uh, which direction things are going to move. A, a lot of our indicators, some are pointing one way, some are pointing the other. I mean, we've, you know, unemployment figures right now aren't, aren't that bad, uh, when, all things considered. So that would be a, and then you've got the equities markets doing really, really well. And then you've got more government spending coming down the pike, which would all point to uh, potentially to inflation. But then you've got, worries that people aren't spending because of potential COVID on the horizon and things like that. So I, you know, I, I I'm reluctant to say. Well, and one, one of the points you made too, I'll follow up on is, you know, we see energy prices in general at the retail level increasing. Again, that's just one part, you know, one basket in this bigger set of baskets. So it's, you know, people might be seeing that at the pump, but that is not everything, at least not yet today. And so it, it really is kind of just that, that, that product space, related, not, not everything. Um, although sometimes it can be a, a harbinger of things to come. Uh, we do have a question uh, for Tim about uh, LFP. So will it be almost double? And our next webinar is actually May 13th. But anyway, to answer Carl's question, which I can't do, I don't know what India, what, what uh, FSA is going to do, I would be very surprised if they double it from last year. All you know, corn has went up, but they look more at hay and forage prices. And, uh, you know, they, they may increase it some, but I can't speak for USDA. But I, I am almost positive that it will not double. <laughs> It'll, it could be up uh, a couple of dollars, but I don't look for it to change a huge amount from last year, even though corn has went up. But we'll have to wait probably till May. Uh, they are being encouraged to get the information out earlier because it's so dry this year compared to last year when uh, a, a lot less uh, drought. So we'll just have to wait and see. Right. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, and as was pointed out, our, our next scheduled webinar is Thursday, May 13th. Uh, it, it's always the Thursday after uh, that monthly WASD, which gives us some a chance to, to look at some other data in the industry. To get uh, access to slides and the recording of this and previous webinars, as well as the correct dates for future webinars, you can go to the, the webpage we have, which is on your screen. Uh, you know, we should have the slides and, and this recording up shortly. I think we're out of questions. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank everybody and you know, it, it's kind of a special day because it should be tax day, but it's not. And so we all have the reprieve for another month or so. So you don't have to, you know, quick uh, print off your stuff and run to the post office before they uh, stop taking that last batch of mail. So I hope you guys all have a great day. Uh, and hopefully uh, we have some better news in terms of, of weather and, and precipitation the next month. And hopefully we'll see you all in May. Thanks. Yes, let's hope it rains. Mm -hmm.